Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk a bit about uh, how to solve homework four. So I'm going to give you a few tips on how to approach this uh, homework assignment. I'm going to start by talking a bit the, the new AST, the new AST, since there are some differences. So as you will, might remember, there will be um, so this is the PDF of homework assignment four. Um, there are two languages, as you might recall. There is a, a language. Um, Lambda S, which uses substitution to implement uh, function calls. And there's a language Lambda E, which uses environments to do uh, function calls. So each of these languages will have um, their own AST. And we cover that in the last lesson, why we need uh, two different ASTs. Uh, so what I'm going to cover, the Lambda S, we already covered this AST. So now today I want to talk a bit about the abstract syntax of Lambda E. And the main difference of lambda e is the values, right? As we've seen in our last lesson. So the values are a number or a closure. Um, and the closure can be seen, well, the number is the same as before, right? But now a closure, as you can see, has two fields, one for the environment and another one for a declaration, which is going to be a function declaration. So when you parse a closure, what you will have on the right hand side will be uh, an E colon lambda. And on the left hand side, you will have a hash, which I'll explain in the following slide. So now for expressions, so an expression could be a value, a variable, a function application, or a function call, and finally, uh, a function declaration or a lambda. So here there are no differences, it works exactly like before. The only difference is that now the lambda appears in an expression. But for the sake of how you use the struct, it's going to be used in the same way. So the the E and the S versions are both, both have the same fields, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so this kind of covers the AST. Uh, next, we could think about how do we represent environments in Racket. And of course, this is um, talking about the environments that we learned in homework uh, in the previous lesson, right? So what we're going to use is uh, hash tables, which in Racket is short for just hash is the name that it is used. And it represents a partial injective functions. Hash tables are covered in CS310, which is a prereq of this course. Um, they're also known as maps or dictionaries. And we use the term hash table just because that's how they're known in Racket. But if you wanted to go more abstract, you would go for maps. Okay, so uh, there are these few functions that you can use. And uh, you are encouraged to go through the manual on hash. So if you Google racket hash, you'll find that. Um, you'll find the manual for this function. And I'm going to go through a few exercises. So the basic idea, let me kind of write that down. So code hash. I actually have a few examples in the next slide, so I'll just copy paste those. Um, so you have a function to create a hash table and it expects key value, key value, key value, right? So following. So if you give it an odd number, you'll get an error. Uh, it accepts as well empty. Um, so if you pass it no parameters, it will create an empty hash table. Um, it also has another constructor called hash set. When you give it a hash table, a key and a value, it overwrites. So th in the next slides, I'm going to show you how to map each of these functions to the formalism. So accessors, you have, uh, well, the query, right, to check if something is a hash table, you have something to tell you how many elements are in the hash table, you can also query if a certain key is there, but you won't need any of this, you will need hash ref though. So hash ref, what it does, it returns the value associated with the key k, given in the second argument. Uh, so now I'm going to copy paste this example and I'm going to show it to you. So lang racket, language. Is it lang or language? I forget. Lang. Okay. Forget how to write racket. 
So now if I do hash examples, uh, I forgot to do require rec unit. Okay, so everything passes. So what we do, let's go step by step. First, we create a new hash table that is empty, right? So if I check how many elements are there, and I can do that with, um, let me move this kind of, it's hard to read. So in the first line, I'm creating a hash table. And in the second line, I am checking how many elements are there. Okay, and I'm making sure there are zero. Right, because when you create and you pass no parameters, you get zero. Right, so if I were to do age, it will print out the hash table, which you'll see it's empty, and this is how it's printed out. Uh, and if I do hash count h, I get the number zero. Okay, um, and I can check if age is a um, a hash table, right, which also works. That's what I have here, and I can check that is false, uh, that a number is not a hash table. All right, so it passes. Okay. Hash table, okay. So then I can extend the hash table by adding, setting a key to a value. So in this case, the key foo to the value, to the assign, I assign that to the number 20. So now you see it, the way it, it, it represents in, in text, in a textual format is with um, foo dot 20. So this is the key and this is the value. So the key is foo, the value is 20, right? So if I were to write a um, thousand, or 100 in this case, it would show 100. Of course, you can store uh, booleans, and you can store as well strings. No problem at all. Okay, so it works as expected. Um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, you can then query to see if, um, you can add another element, that's what I'm gonna do. So. In this case, what I did was, um, so if I have H1, and I print it out, I get what you expect. So tw uh, I can add 20, and if I do hash set, and if I add uh, bar 30, now it will show up foo and bar. They're both defined in this hash table. And if I do hash get, a foo, a foo, I get, um, no, href, not, I get 20, and if I do bar, I should get 30. And if I do something that doesn't exist, I should get, I think it gets an error. Yeah, it gives you an error. Okay. So, in this example, what I'm doing is I'm overriding. So, H was previously, uh, sorry, first I'm, I'm making sure that H1 is the same as creating a new hash table, right, from scratch, of course that makes sense. Uh, and then what I do is I overwrite, um, you can overwrite values, right, so in this case foo is assigned to 20, and if I do hash set uh, of H1 to 200, and then I print out, um, Oh, what, what hash, hash set returns is the new hash table, right? So if I print this out, um, of course it needs the key. It should return the new hash table, right? But notice that the original hash table remains unchanged. Okay, so h1 is still 20, but in, in, in the result of performing a set, it creates a new hash table with, uh, where we updated the value of the key. Okay, which is what we do in this following test. So that won't be surprising to you. Uh, and finally, we, we're reading the contents of the hash table and we're making sure that um, the original hash table was unchanged like I just did here. Okay, so the example for now, I hope it's understandable. And this is how 
how you use a hash table and these are all the functions you will need i mean you don't even need all of these you won't need hash count you won't need hash question mark but just for the sake of completeness i'm giving them to you um okay so now uh, where do we use environments right so if you're wondering that you might want to go through a few things first uh, there's the homework where do we where will you need hash tables it will be in this question question three uh, to implement lambda e right and lambda e uh, 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 lambda e let me lambda e is lecture 19 and this is a bit too far so this e that you see here is going to be the hash table right so how are we using the hash table so here the hash table is being uh, is a second parameter as you know here you're using this the hash table so what you're doing is you're calling you're reading the value of the hash table of the environment e the hash table e capital e right uh, so that return that pertains to which operation well operation ref right operation ref is what returns the contents of the hash table so when you see this what you should be returning is hash ref okay um, and here is the other the only other place where you will see a hash table and what are we doing here well here we're updating assigning to the key x the value ga so where did we learn how to do that? Well, it's going to be this operation. Hash set would be the hash table E, and then the X, and then VA, right? So it's more or less where you would see it. Uh, let me go back. Okay, so what is the empty set? The empty set represents um, empty calling hash. Looking up represents hash ref. Extending the environment represents hash set. Um, and this is all that you will need for um, exercise three, right? Um, okay, so next, let me see, oops, let me go back to this. Uh, then what we have, we have a few tests, but before that, I wanna talk a bit about, um, I wanna go through the PDF and I wanna explain a bit what's going on on each exercise. So the first one, uh, I'll, I'm asking you to implement the substitution operation. So it's going to be this notation where you have, it's basically a function that takes three parameters, right? It takes an E, takes an X, takes a V. These will be the three parameters that it's going to take. You can see them here. So E is going to be EXP, X is going to be VAR, and V is going to be VAL, right? Um, the objective is for you to implement such a function. And where is this function defined? I define it formally in this slide, which is lecture 17, slide 23. Um, and the way you implement this code is you can think of each of these lines as branches. So basically it will be a recursive function that has a branch, a conditional. And what it's doing is it's going through, it's basically you have to find and replace all the through the whole, all of the expression, right? So you're kind of like navigating through the whole tree and rewriting it. So there's a, uh, a case for numbers, there's a case for variables, there's a, two cases for variables, really. Uh, there's a case for um, lambda, another case for lambda, and finally a case for a function application. So your conditional should have all of these cases. Sometimes what people do is they group the cases with variables together and the cases with lambdas together. So these two together in a, in a branch of con and these two in a branch of, of r. And what you need to check in this first uh, branch is whether um, the input exp equals the, the var and here when they're not the same. And here what you have to do is if your, uh, your exp is gonna be this lambda, so you're gonna check if the lambda param is going to be the same as x which is var in the code okay another thing to keep in mind is when you're writing the code because as you know the ast expects um a list of, of parameters and a list of body and you might you know in in your in the code as we've learned in homework in this module all the functions only have one parameter so they're going to have a list with a single 
thing and you can expect that uh, and the body as well it's going to be a list so to help that I, re I wrote this in the test case sorry in the homework you're going to have um, these utility functions uh, which is which return the first argument the first parameter and the first element of the body so you should use these instead of you know getting the first of the lambda all the time so these uh, utility functions are very useful um, for all all um, all exercises that you have to do okay you only have to do three so then I want to cover these two separately uh, they're going to be the actually the last one separately so for now let's let's go through the one for subs for evaluation so this is where we're implementing um, oh wait it's right here lecture 17 slide 21 basically you have to implement this function I already give you the how it's implemented you're going to have a conditional with two branches right and this is the recursive code you have to write so substitution is going to call the substitution function but do notice that in the PDF uh, the PDF is here um, the substitution is given as parameter and this is important so that I can uh, you know you don't need to do substitution to get this uh, question right so you can if you submit it to grade scope I'll I'll instantiate I'll pass a correct implementation of substitution I won't use yours uh, so that you can get partial credit for you know just this question without needing to complete the first exercise first so you can do them out of order really um, okay so we kind of cover that let me see yeah so this I already explained that this should be a recursive function that there should be a conditional so these are all recursive code and then the way you should look at this is this is the body this is what's going to happen in your branch so you're going to execute this code then this then that plus it's saying something about the output so in this case what it's saying is the output is has to be um, e colon lambda right and then what it's saying is because you're seeing x here it means but you see x here right so what it's saying is that when you call subst you need to pass the x that is in the return of eval e of f right and instead of me saying how to do that i'm i'm giving you this notation which is if you think about it it's it's, it's known as pattern matching right where we we're saying that the output of evaluating is going to be a lambda that has some name x and I'm using this x here so how do I get this x pretty easy you use s param 1 right how do I get e of b well you use s body 1 okay it's gonna be pretty easy okay and va is the result of this okay so this should be a pretty easy um, homework assignment to do what I want you to keep in mind is your solution should match as closely as possible what is in the slides. So if you try to diverge and try to be uh, creative, it's very easy to get it wrong. If you try to just implement blindly what is here, that's the shortest path to success. So really the, the challenge in this homework assignment is really trying to understand how do I map this notation to code? Because really what's going to happen in any kind of work is you're going to have some rough draft of an algorithm that you're going to have to implement, right? And it can come from many sources. So this is an example of how you could approach, you know, if you're working for any kind of uh, company that uh, implements algorithms from a paper, they could appear like this. So you need to understand how to take some semi-formal notation and Im implement that that's mainly what's going on here and at the same time teaching you how to actually implement the evaluation of a function okay okay in the next uh, video i'm going to cover the test cases it themselves okay